part three um, tonight, but in finishing part three, we were talking about worm theology, unconditional love. We were talking about where all of that came from, from Isaac Watts' song in 1707, a line out of there, would he devote such a sacred head for such a worm as I? And for over 300 plus years, that worm theology has been alive and well and thriving in numerous denominations. <clears throat> it is deep rooted in origins of Calvinism. Um, John Calvin was from 1509 to 1564, the 16th century Protestant reformer who got his theology from August uh, Augustine of Hippo. Um, he's right, he was right in there. Augustine of Hippo was right in there with Constantine's spiritual lies and pollution manipulation, gaslighting, and the buying of the church. And from there, I, I want to read this to you. I Martin, you can bring up the Isaiah effect. I'm going to read this to you. And um, we went over this a few weeks ago where we talked about when we were going through Genesis 1, 2, 3, and 4, what Constantine did to the church, with the church, the abuse of the church, and how the... Uh, how everything changed from what the first century church was. So the book I'm reading out of is called The Isaiah Effect. So Martin's got that, but uh, I sent you the cover, The Isaiah Effect. So I want to read this, this out to you. 1700 years ago, key elements of our ancient heritage were lost, relegated to elite priesthood and esoteric traditions of the day in an effort to simplify and loosely organized religion and historic traditions of the time the early early in the fourth century a.d the roman emperor constantine formed a council of historians and scholars that would be later known as the Council of Nice or the Nicene Council, fulfilled the directive of its charter and recommended that at least 25 documents be modified or removed from the collection of the Holy Bible or the text. The committee found many of the works under consideration to be either redundant maybe overlapping stories or repeated parables. Other manuscripts were so ab abstract and were so were so abstract and in some cases so beautifully mystical that they were believed to be beyond any practical value. Additionally, another 20 supporting documents were removed, held in reserve for only privileged researchers and select scholars. The remaining books were condensed and rearranged to give them greater meaning and make them more accessible to the common reader. Each of these decisions contributed further to the confusing of the mystery of our purpose, possibilities, and relationships to one another. Following the accomplishment of their tasks, the council produced a single document in AD 325. The result of their labor remains with us perhaps one of the most controversial texts of history. It is known today as the Holy Bible. 1700 later, 1700 years later, the implications of the Nicene Council's actions continue to mold politics, social structure, religious understandings, and the technology of our lives. Although we live in a sophisticated world based in science, the assumptions that led to our technical achievements are firmly rooted in our beliefs and how we relate to our world. Such understandings developed over thousands of years and have become the very foundation of science. For example, how would the petroleum technology that drives our economy today differ if instead we had recognized the laws of harmony and power our machines by simply tuning them into the seven 
centimeter bandwidth of energy that permeates our world. Such technology and belief system that understands the holistic laws of nature. So let me go, Martin, can you put up the picture? This picture that he's gonna show you, this is what the Nicene Council took out of our original Bible. They took out the book of Barnabas, first Clement, second Clement, Christ and Abigurus, the Apostle Creeds, first Hermes vision, second Hermes commands, third Hermes similitudes, the rest of the book of Ephesians, one infancy, two infancies, the book of Mary, the Magicians, the book of Nicodemus, Paul and Seneca, Paul and Thecla, the rest of the book of the Philippians, the book of Philadelphians, Polycarp, the rest of the book of Romans, uh, Trialians, the letters of Herod and Pilate. I would love to get my hands on them. Um, and then this is the books that they refuse to allow anybody but sacred priests read. The first book of Adam and Eve, the second book of Adam and Eve, the secrets of Enoch, which I have, the Psalms of Solomon, the Odes of Solomon, the fourth book of Maccabees, the story, story of Alakar, the Testament of Reuben, Asher, Joseph. These are the 12 tribes of Israel. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishgar, Zebulun, Dan, Nephali, Gad, and Benjamin. Then he goes on to talk about that the consequence of removing or in some case altering these 41 books and possibly others detailing our heritage and relationship to the cosmos remains with us today. The absence of key texts may explain the sense many individuals have expressed that our biblical records are scattered and incomplete. So then right after all of this was found in, um, in a uh, town not far from, uh, well, it's Nagamasi, but it's in Egypt, and they found scrolls with 54 more books. So this was first found, these books that I just shared with you were found first left out of our Bibles. And then they found these. There's a third book of the book of Corinthians. There's a book of uh, uh, Thomas, uh, where he quotes direct, uh, directly out of everything almost Jesus wrote. There's a lot of the book of Revelation left out. Um, so... So in a lot of cases, they felt that it was too um, too mystical or too whatever. Whatever the reasons were, there's first, second, third, and fourth Maccabees. Um, a lot of this, there's Barak. A lot of this was Sirach. A lot of this is in some of the Catholic Bibles, the Book of Wisdom, um, Judith. Uh, the full book of Esther, the full book of uh, Tobit. So where am I going with all of this? That somebody, well, Constantine in his, his haste, in order to bring the church under compliance, and that's when they changed Christmas. That's when they changed the Sabbath. And we talked about all of that when we went through Genesis. When all of that was going on, um, that's when priests began to be getting paid an actual salary. Now, I'm not against any priest, pastor, anybody getting a salary. That That's not what I'm saying. A workman is worth their wages, whether they're working in the, in, um, you know, the ministry realm or they're working, you know, doing whatever God has called them to do. What I'm trying to say in all of that is once the priests began getting paid, Constantine told them what he they could preach every week. So they had to stop preaching about all the mysticism, everything from um, heart and uh, mind coherence to levitation to uh, translations. They, they stopped everything that had to do with mysticism and everything that had to do with diet, believe it or not. So, and saying all of that, 
out of that time period after Constantine, Augustine of Hippo was right around the time of Constantine, Calvinism and John Wesleyism, Protestantism is very much rooted in that worm theology that you will never be good enough for God. Now, I know that I just said a lot in a big mouthful, and maybe some of you guys knew some of this, but when you take, when you take out something as important as the words of Jesus Christ or the words of God the Father to us as people, then what ends up happening is we're not getting the full picture. Now, has our has our 66 books saved lives? Absolutely. Has our 66 books healed bodies and changed minds and healed marriages and done miraculous things? Absolutely. But how much more on top of our 66 books would we, if we would have had the 40 something that they took out that and the 20 something that were just too mystical for us. And then the 54 of the Apocrypha that I just think, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Maybe all the answers that people have been looking for all their lives could have been right there, right there at their fingertips. And I'm not saying that our 66 books, you can't find it in here, but there's a lot of missing pieces. Um, like I was listening to, I found the uh, Essene, book one of the Essene Gospel of Peach, Peace, uh, E-S-S-E-N-C-E, -E, I think is how it's spelled. And it's just Jesus talking the whole time. And he's talking about our diet and he's talking about our weight. And he's talking about, he goes into detail about all of Moses's 613 laws. And he's like, you obey Moses's 613 laws, but you won't obey the 10 commandments. And if you just obeyed the 10 commandments, you wouldn't even need to listen to Moses's 613 laws. And I'm like listening to this. And he talks about how gluttony will kill people. He's talking about how obesity and the types of food that we eat. And I'm like, okay, so you've got all this stuff in here in our 66 books about being wine bibbers, but don't mess with people's potlucks on Sundays. When Jesus was very clear about what to eat, how to eat it, when to eat it, he says to eat um, when the sun is high in the sky and to stop before it gets dusk. I looked at Martin, I go, I've been doing that for years. I didn't even know Jesus said that. And so as I'm listening to these teachings this week, I'm like, Martin, what we have is amazing. It's amazing. I cried one day all day because I just, I felt this grief that how many people die of obesity, but if they would have known that Jesus gave them instructions, and I'm not saying they would or wouldn't have, but what if they trusted Jesus's voice or words, red words win, right? So much that they would have said, well, if my master told me to do it, not to do it, maybe I oughtn't to do it. How many people are diabetics? How many people are sick in their bodies because they eat just whatever they want when there were was clear instructions about what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat? He even goes down to how many pounds of food you should eat a day. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like in the bathroom, putting on my makeup going, okay, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. You know, and as a nutritional holistic health person, I'm 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 like, I want to scream this to the entire United States, who is some of the most obese in the world, right? So I'll post everything in WhatsApp, but I wanted to share that with you. When and when you read the book of Thomas, he is directly quoting Jesus word for word. He doesn't go, the gospel of Thomas is not even, it's not like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's like he followed Jesus around, you know, with a, you know, a tablet or something of that his day. And he just wrote down phrases that line up perfectly with the four gospels, but it's not a chronological, um, 
deal like how our gospels are set up and and when you read uh third corinthians i'm like oh my goodness the thing that struck me the most i was like where did paul get first corinthians 13 well the 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 um essene gospel of peace Jesus does all of first Corinthians 13. So Paul is directly quoting Jesus. Now, why isn't Jesus being given credit for that? So I'm like, okay, all of these are not, I don't call them redundant because somebody else repeats them. If I'm reading, I'm reading Greg Braden's book. I'm not being redundant by teaching you something because now you'll get to go teach it to somebody else because now you have the knowledge. And really that's what the gospel, sharing the gospel is all about. You take what you've learned, you share it with somebody else, you build up their most holy faith and you empower them to go search out more answers for themselves because they're like, oh, I have this little nugget. Now let me go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And pretty soon, soon wherever they were hurting in their lives or wherever they felt that there was some kind of emotional deficit or physical deficit or, or, or whatever was going on um that starts being done away with the word became flesh and dwelt among us he sent his word and healed them so after i got through the teary part then i got the mad part i'm like he sent his word and healed them they had no right to take the word away no right to take any away. it's up to me it's up to you to decide if that word doesn't apply to you but it's not up to somebody you know 1700 years ago to decide what i would need today or what you would need today to get through something in today's world. Because that's what prophecy is. Prophecy is literally seeing into the future, recording what's gonna may happen or gonna happen. You know, uh, let's go back to the book of Isaiah, because this book is literally called the Isaiah effect. And Isaiah happens to be my favorite prophet. So you know, 735 years ago, Isaiah prophet, uh, the prophet prophesied that Jesus was coming. Read Isaiah 6, 7, 8, 9. He, he talked about the coming of the king. He talked about that he's that the end of his government would be there. There would be no end to his government and all the prophecies that came down. And and uh, I found, you know, uh, listening to some of these uh, you can find some of these books on YouTube, the audio and uh, listening to the, the, some of this. I'm like, oh, my goodness. No wonder. Oh, oh, OK. Jesus quoted that. And Jesus said that. And Mark said that. And Luke said that. And Paul said that. And you wonder, OK, where did they get all of that? Well, they got it from the books like uh the book of Enoch is quoted something like 106 times in what we call the New Testament. Now, why would they leave the book of Enoch out if everybody's going to quote from him? So it's um, it was an interesting week this week. And how did all of this apply to what's going on now? Because what's happened is just like uh, we learned a few weeks ago, Jesus said, you heard it said and he's referring to oral, oral oral tradition and we learned that when it says it is written that he's talking about the actual book but how many times did he quote out of books that are not in our bibles that's quite the emphasis huh because he quoted out of enoch and enoch is not in our bible so, okay, we also learned that theology came from wrong translations and interpretations of Bibles and verses. So Bibles that verses that were, you know, turned around and pieces left out and things that happened, uh, words got moved around. And we talked about um, how... I talked about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and the five stages of grief. And now they know that none of that, it's only a partial truth. There's hundreds of stages of grief. 
and that the only people she actually interviewed about grief were 18 dying people, but she never, her conclusions were incomplete. This was in the 1970s. She never went back and interviewed the families that lost the, that the dying people were left behind. And so her conclusions that there's only five stages was completely incomplete. Now they know that there is well over, maybe close to a hundred different emotions, feelings, physiological, physical, mental, emotional, relational, uh, financial. They know that all, and all of that has its own subcategory. So, but yet that instituted um, what we now call you know, I don't know. I, I, I just hospice. I, I understand that hospice has got its place, but now feeling sad for people that are ascending uh, or, or dying or, you know, near death. Now we have hospice that comes in and gives everybody all of this medication and et cetera, et cetera, when that used to not be. And so that is now a multi-million dollar industry out, multi-billion dollar industry, really. So um, all of that's been completely debunked. We talked about now they're trying to change BC before Christ and AD. Um, I know no, and Anno Domini, uh, they're trying to change it to, you know, before common era and common era. They're trying to take Christ out of the whole thing. Well, that's, I'm not doing that. I, I just absolutely refuse. And um, we learned that, um, hold on, Jesus's message was no religion and unconditional love. So in all of that, we learned that penal substitution atonement and that it, came from the 16th century reformers known as forensic legal judicial doctrine or governmental theory theory of atonement. So I'm just doing a little bit of review here. Um, Jesus came to challenge all of these false views saying they couldn't say the name of the father or write it. And he, he said the name of the father constantly and um, he introduced God as the all-loving father, fulfilling every old, co old covenant prophecy and law, types, shadows, themes, holidays, temple requirements. He challenged all of the Talmud, which is the oral traditions. Remember, we learned about the oral traditions back when we were doing Genesis um, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um Jesus even said, you are following the oral traditions and not the written word of God. Um, that, that was really powerful. And we learned to remember the nature of God, the nature of man, the way God deals with man. These three truths in you and in your belief systems will shape your unconditional love. You know, um, part of my little pet peeve as a minister is hearing that God, you know, took the life of somebody. I'm like, where's that? Where's that? No, their sin usually takes them or that's, that's another whole teaching on cleansing and, and disease. But we learned that even um, Isaiah 53, 10 was mistranslated. God is not the ugly punisher. He did not want to punish Jesus for our sins. He doesn't get need to get his name back as far as his reputation. And so um, we finished up, um, let's see, last week. Uh, we went through crucify him is in numerous places in the Bible. John 19, 6 through 16, Luke 23, uh, Mark 15, 13, Matthew 27, 16, crucify him, crucify him. Um, what does atonement mean? The atonement cleanses all. In the resurrection, all was healed all was on the cross and all was finished for you as you. Um, Jesus subjugated himself to death, but death, Thanos. So for those of you that are Marvel comic freaks, that word Thanos is, you know, in the Marvel people. 
Um, but death, Thanos could not hold him. Why? Because nothing, no thing is greater and more powerful than the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We talked about in the 40 days after the resurrection, thousands of people saw Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, over 500 at one time. That's amazing. That's, come on. I mean, that right there should all have us screaming and shouting and jumping. And, and you know, we, we, we minor on the majors and majors on the minor. You know, when Jesus died, all the graves were popped open. Come on, somebody. Death could not even hold the dead people. Have you thought about that? That death could not even hold all the people that were already dead in graves. So when you go to Israel, when you go to Israel around two of the, and when you walk around um, Jerusalem, okay, those walls are way tall and wide enough to drive a car on on the top. I mean, they're massive. It's just massive. You feel like you're like a little tiny ant next to them. But on one side where it's the golden gates, it's a double gate. That's when, when Jesus, you know, they say Jesus comes back, that those gates are going to be busted open. Well, in front of all of that, because they want their people raised first, all the Muslims have uh, buried all their people right there. So somebody's got some faith in Jesus. Because why? The graves were popped open once already when jesus died read your bible what does it say all the dead the dead were came back to life the graves popped open and they were walking around having dinner with their families come on somebody that's shouting ground and and, and we never talk about all the people in the bible that never did die they were they were translated they never found John's body. They have a fake grave with John's body in it. What about Enoch? What about Elijah? What about uh, uh, Moses's body? Satan fought, fought over that. Where is it? So when we talk about that death could not hold these people, that some of them walked so closely with God and were translated, we're taught literally in church from the time we're infants that the only way to get to heaven is to die. That's the only way you can do. And you got to go through Jesus, which I agree with 1000%. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other door to, to, to the Father except through the Son. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, before they took all of these amazing books out of the Bible, the, the mystical stuff that happened is now excised out of the American church. And we need to start turning this stuff around. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. The church was never, ever, ever meant to go hear announcements two or three, four songs, and then one person get up there and preach. No, church in the New Testament, everybody was involved doing stuff. They were laying hands on the sick. They were out in the streets. They were feeding the poor. It's nothing like it is now. And nothing, and I mean not even nothing close. The first time Peter preached, thousands got saved and healed all at the same time. Come on, where's that power Where's that mystery? Where's that awe? Death could not hold him. And so I think if, if the Lord releases me, I, we're going to go into life at some life and death scriptures. So <clears throat> I, I'm really excited. So where are we now? We're in the victorious church. Christ victorious is what we actually are. Christ victorious. The anointed one who is the victorious over sin and death. Not just when they know for sure now. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if I've shared this now. So now they weigh people right before death if they can and right after. And everybody that dies loses the same amount of weight. And guess what science calls it? The human soul and spirit that ascended out of the body. I know. I know I can, I, even though y'all aren't showing your faces, I know I'm telling you, I am like a little science medical geek. I love this stuff. 
Why? Because I believe science is proving out that we are spirit, soul, and body. And how can the weight of an infant baby be the same as a 160 something man that when they weigh them after death, the same amount of weight is lost? They say it's the human spirit and body. Come on, somebody. That's powerful. And now because of the technology that we have on earth, we're able to watch some of these people ascend like, like that, just quick, fast. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool, pretty cool. So we talked about uh, uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure who can understand it and what it actually says. The heart of man is so deep and beyond all things. And it is the man, but who can definitely, or who can actually know him? Who can know him? That's in Jeremiah. Now, Jesus knew the hearts and intents of all men. I love that. And that is numerous places in the Bible. And I covered that last week. So I left off here. Um, we are ambassadors of reconciliation and love. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. And this is going to finish up um, unconditional love for this week. Unless God gives me another one, I think this is going to be it. So turn your Bibles, if you have them with you, to 2 Corinthians 5. And then I think we're going to start in verse 11. New Testament, right behind the book of Romans. Second Corinthians 5. And we're going to go over, be reconciled to God. So let me start up at verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuaded him, but we're, we are well known to God. And I also trust we are known in your conscience. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. So he's talking about the ego there, the, the ego and the heart are not lining up. For we are beside ourselves, for it is God, for it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus and if one died for all then all died now that verse right there has been misinterpreted numerous times and i think we're going to go into some of this pretty soon and he died for all that those who should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again and he goes on um and Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we now, yet now we know him, thus no longer. In other words, when somebody's acting ridiculous, know that it's not really them, that's their flesh. Don't regard somebody to the flesh. Therefore, if anyone is a new uh, in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And that word right there is amazing. It's kinos. Kinos means new, unused, fresh, a novel, never was before. You can't like rebuild it. It's brand new. Um. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That word passed away means completely perished. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us um, the ministry of reconciliation. And, and it goes on to talk about that we are ambassadors all the way down and, and to verse 21. We're ambassadors. That's what we do. We tell people the truth. We share the love of God with them. And where correction needs to be made, we correct people in love. That That's one of the things that I absolutely love to do is to, to 
push people's thinking way past what they've been used to. And we talked about last week that no, no labels anymore, no labels from your past carry any weight into your spirit, soul, and body, that your psyche is pure, that you have the mind of Christ, and the whole revelation, the whole mind change, the whole heart change. When you see, literally see, he has died as us because of love, not because of a penal substitution um, situation. It, it, God wasn't trying to make a point by try, uh, killing his son. We learned over and over and over in the scripture, God did not kill his son, man did. Man chose it. They were even given a choice to let him go, and they didn't. Um, the parable of the lost coin, sheep, son, shows that the Lord never lost us, that our value never diminished. That was another thing that was on that, um, the Essene uh, uh, gospel of peace. He went into the full story of the, Jesus recited the entire story of the parable of the prodigal son. And I, I, Martin caught up with me walking and I was like, you are not going to believe this. He got an earful for like an hour. And I go, this is just, why aren't we, we've got to get this word out. We've got to get it out. And if that's my mission, if that's my mission to give everybody all, all the scripture, then they can call me a heretic. They can call me anything they want, but I want people to get the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You deserve it because christ died for it you deserve it because christ died for it and anything that he has said or written you deserve to have it in your hands so you can study it and evaluate it for yourself okay um the God's love is the same for us as it is for Jesus. And we went through John 17 last week. And I just love that. And for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So when we think of the word lost, we think of something that is missing, right? Honestly, in our English language. Well, that is not what it means. It's the word apolomeni. It means to destroy and fully, uh, to, to destroy fully, to perish and to die. So he came to seek those that were destroyed, that were perishing, and that were dead. Not, not missing. Uh, that puts another whole, that, that's Luke 19.10 in case you want. The lost, um, not lost like it's, you know, misplaced somewhere, but lost like it was destroyed fully, perished completely, died. Okay, so if he came to seek and to save that which was completely dead, completely perished, completely um, and fully destroyed, only he has got the power through the Holy Spirit to put it all back together. How else did the graves pop open? Hmm. How did he get out of the grave? It's just something for your theology to take a lot deeper. If he came to seek and save that which was lost. Every time I was ever taught that scripture, it was about, oh, you're a wicked sinner and you were lost. No, I was dead in my trespasses and I was dying in my body and I was perishing. And I, I no, it wasn't about being misplaced somewhere. God never misplaced me. I misplaced me by not being in Christ. That's another theology that is wrong theology. Um, God is not wrathful, angry, bitter, mad. And he doesn't want justice. Justice was already done paid on the cross. How much more justice can there be? John 3, 16. So for God so loved the world, that word is agape. So you could write it this way in your Bible. 
for God so unconditionally loved the world. Let me read it to you the way it actually is. John 3, 16. Everybody wants to quote that, but nobody really wants to teach it. John 3, 16. For God so unconditionally loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, that word is the gift. He gave it. It's a gift. It doesn't say that God killed his son for us, but that's how it's been interpreted. So God gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. There's the word perish again, lost, um, but have ever lasting life everlasting everlasting that's been taught that you have to receive jesus in order just to get to heaven but he also goes on to teach that the kingdom of heaven is now here in you we just leave all that part out so my i think my mission for the rest of my life uh is going to be stretching people what does the bible actually say about that what does it actually say or are you just quoting what you've been taught handed down since constantine what does it actually say i know i know i uh it's okay i love everybody who won't like me after this it's okay someone who loves uh completely and unconditionally is not looking for revenge that was the, that's what God gave me after I read it the way it actually is. A God who loves completely and unconditionally is not looking for revenge. Wow. I just kind of sat there stunned. Yeah, yeah, that kind of really makes sense. How can you unconditionally love in one breath and look for revenge in another? Okay, I got uh, okay, Lord. I'm getting this now. I'm 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 deprogramming and I am coming into reconciliation. So reconciling us to the Father, not counting their sins against them. That's 2 Corinthians 5:19. So if there are not any sins held against us, there's no trespasses against us, there's no guilt or no condemnation. That's Romans 8. Where does the wrathful father come into play? There isn't any record of wrong in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Uh, where does all the wrathfulness come in? If there's no record of wrongdoing, if our sins have been as far removed from the east as from the west and the two shall never twine meet, then where does the wrathful God that needs justice come in? penal substitution that's where it comes in um so anyway i am really excited about all of this because it's been literally transforming and changing my mind um in first john three can we turn there i'm not even sure at this point why i wrote that down but i'll bet you i'll figure it out when we get there first john chapter three and we're going to start at verse eight is what my notes say i'm sorry verse five i apologize Okay, I see where I wrote that. Sin and the child of God. And you know that he was made manifest to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteousness, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil means to untie and completely unloose all the works whoever is born of god does not sin for his seed remains in him he cannot sin because he has been born of god i, I absolutely love that so you know the the bible the mirror bible which i don't have a current translation says there that you're you 
says that you are the offspring of a fallen mindset. In other words, what you've been taught your whole life about who God is and who you are is the, a fallen mindset. The enemy has tricked you into thinking you're no good, you're unworthy, that he's not. And this stuff is perpetuated in churches all over the world every Sunday every Wednesday. And I'm not saying every church does it. I have no ought against any church whatsoever, but I'm telling you that you are worthy, that you are precious to God. You don't give up a beautiful, beautiful son and give him as a gift. And then mankind kills him. And then for something lesser, why, why would, why would, no, it doesn't even make human sense, let alone spiritual sense. So, um, I just want to tell you that it has been a blast actually for me to, to teach this. And I want to share one outreach that I did with you, did while I was still living in California. Um, every, every holiday, either Christmas or Thanksgiving, I would go down to what they called Ninth Street in Modesto and I would make reservations at a nice restaurant and I would gather up all the street girls that I could find. Sometimes we had three or four cars full and I, I would have, I'd go to the restaurant first and I would decorate it all out. And I would have all kinds of presents for them on the table and all, whatever I could just bless them with. And, you know, their johns weren't happy with them and they were really pissed off at me, but I didn't care. I put my life on the line for them. And we'd, um, you know, I had to make sure that they had on clothes, literally close, you know, everything from bras to panties to shoes to whatever, um, you know, uh, California pretty much has a strict law, no, no shirt, no shoes, you know, no entry, whatever. And so, um, these girls would sit there for one or two hours and the meal was on us. I didn't care how much it cost. And we would just lavish these girls with clothes and hair brushes and toothbrushes and toothpaste and and I never looked at them as less than uh, some of them wanted to get clean and we would find you know halfway houses for them but mostly their johns kept them drunk and and stoned so they could do what they could do you know you can only sell drugs once but you can sell a human body over and over and over and uh uh in one night actually so the Lord gave me this idea, downloaded that I needed to get an actual throne, an actual throne with red carpet, uh, the red velvet ties, the whole thing. And I searched around the country. They were thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I finally found one out of Las Vegas. It came out of a mansion that had burned down and this firefighter crabbed this throne and saved it. And it was in an antique shop and this lady had done the best she could to restore it. And they were using it at um, uh, St. Jude's church to... At Christmas time, Santa would sit in it for all the sick kids and come sit on his lap and everything. And so I had it shipped from Vegas to um, my house in Valley Springs. And the, the, the lady, when I told her what I wanted it for, she sold me this beautiful antique chair for like $300. And I had it shipped and delivered to my house. And we would take it down on Ninth Street where I would pick up these girls and we would roll out the red carpet and I had crowns, beautiful crystal crowns. And I would let them walk down this um, red carpet and sit on this throne with these beautiful robes on. And it didn't matter what their, on, what their clothes were. I, I didn't care. And uh, we'd put the crown and I'm telling you, their little bodies would go from not being able to look up and I'd put that crown on them and they would just sit up and their posture would change. And it makes me really weep now thinking about it. I'm telling you that we've got to stop thinking of ourselves the way that they thought about themselves. You are that person sitting on that throne. It says you are seated in heavenly places, plural, with Christ Almighty, you're sitting at the right hand of God the Father with a crown on. And that's that's 
how we have to see ourselves from now on, because you can't do the works of Jesus Christ if you think of yourself less than Jesus Christ himself. You can't. How can you believe you could be a miracle worker through Christ if you don't even believe that he did the miracles so that you could do them through him? And so tonight, I just want to impart to you that you're worth, you're worth him dying on the cross. You're worth it. You're worth it. He thought it was worth it. I know you're worth it. He wouldn't have done it if he wasn't, if you weren't worth it. He had you on his mind over 2000 years later. So whatever your past is, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it's done. It's over. You're a brand new Kainos creation living, and you can ascend to heaven as much as you want. You don't have to wait to die to do it. That's all prayer is. Prayer is getting into your spirit and your soul and allowing yourself to go up and converse with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and believe that he's conversing with you right now seeing it in your mind's eye, believing it, feeling it. We don't have to beg for anything. So that concludes part three of this. And it's, that's it. And I, I'm just so glad you guys can unmute.